Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Ronan Nazarene Talks. I'm one of your hosts, Saul Ronan from Saul Ronan Films. And I'm the annoying one, Nazarene Prod. I'm the interrupting one. <laughs> welcome. Um, and today we're going to talk about two Michael Powell films, but two Michael Powell films without Emmerich Pressburger, Peeping Tom from 1960, and Age of Consent from 1969. Look at these snazzy covers. Matching snazzy couples. <laughs> They're both the same idea, yes. And both are wonderful in their own separate little ways. Yes. But one's a lot bit more wonderful than another, we have to be honest. Yes. Like, so one do you want them... me to do Peeping Tom and I'll let you do Age of Consent? Yep, that's fine. I'd much rather talk about Peeping Tom and yes. describe it in the age of consent. Yes. <laughs> I'd rather throw you under that all. bus. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Yeah, it's really weird when the serial killer cinematography one is the one you want to talk about over the other one. Yes. Yeah, so um, Peeping Tom, you know, again, I'll show you this snazzy cover because it is a wonderful box set, an oil box set, uh, box cover, and a nice release from Optimum Classic. You get commentaries in this, and you get like interviews and things like that. So it's really nice. Um, yeah, I wish Criterion would actually upgrade it to Blu-ray. It is in Criterion and DVD, but I know. I've, I think I've got that one. In the, I've got my two the Criterion ones of the DVDs of the. Yeah, old, I've got the DVD of it, but yeah. But um, Peeping Tom is the one that um, kind of ended Michael Pell's career. Even though it's more complicated than that, because a lot of it is to do with distribution and different studio heads he annoyed over in the past, because Michael Pell was not the easiest person along with, apparently. You know, he's... Oh, he was a perfectionist, but that's... Yeah, and he did insult some think... people that he shouldn't have. Yeah, but... he didn't have time for people that couldn't be of use to him, pretty much. Yeah, and um, he tiny to copy what idiots have they thought it would have been idiotic. So... This is what happened after he and Pressburger had split because they basically they, they weren't, weren't being the peak films anymore. And I think Paul was not feeling they were going anywhere. So they split up and Paul went on his own. And he made a film called Peeping Tom, written by Leo March, which was about a cameraman who also kills women. And he's trying to um, record the deaths, and he's got his own weird fixations about cinema and what cinema is. And it's about his character. It's about the police investigation to find out who did it. But that's a, not very important to the film. It's probably the the first part of the film with the least amount of who done it ever. You could just you know, I'm in the main character straight away. You know he did it, and the police is just some in the background. And you've also got my romance with this young woman who lives at, uh, below him in his in his block of flats, which he owns and he grew up in. So it's about um, what psychological damage a father can do to their children, because his father was a, ther- a therapist for children, specialising in children, and he messed up his own child quite a bit, and this boy could only, as he grew up, he could only really communicate through cinema and through imagery and through his cameras and through the technique of filmmaking. It was his only way of actually finding a way to express himself. And it's how morbid and how twisted that can become. Does that decent sum up? Yep, that's, that sums up. Of course, his father wanted to, think, to kind of study fear yeah. And, and he used his own son as an example. And, of course, the father is played by Michael Powell. He doesn't have any speaking parts, but he's seen in footage, which is kind of Michael Powell's sense of humour as well. Plus, um, I think it was his own son as uh, the young yeah, it was his killer. Son. <laughs> which makes yeah. it just wonderful. Yeah, yeah. it's about... Because we are complicit. You know, it starts with a POV shot of the camera, very much like beginning of Halloween. 
Um, so we are kind of put in the same position as the killer. We are complicit in a lot of what happens because it's not only about scoptophilia, it's also about cinephilia, essentially, and the yeah. power of the camera and the audience as the camera as well. Yeah, and, and he's watching this, all his footage and uh, through a projector onto a screen in his home, just like yeah. you and I do. Yes. Not that it makes us feel guilty or anything. Oh. And it's quite and funny because I... this film really, um, the one film I was thinking about a lot when I was re-watching was Manhunter. Because yeah. there's lots of crossover with that. Yeah. So it's, yes, yeah, some of the dialogue is aged, like the prostitute saying it will be two quid. I think prices yeah. have went up a bit since then. Um, but a lot of the ideas are still, have been reused and a lot of the ideas are still relevant. So even though some of the dialogue has changed, obviously from 1960, um, I think it's still relevant and still fresh and still challenging. And I think that was one of the reasons I got into trouble because one, the killer played by Carl Bohm is sympathetic yeah. He's not just a one-dimensional monster, which obviously gave critics problems. And two, it's a view of Britain that I don't think some critics really wanted to accept. Yeah, because it looks at Britain as if Britain is a twisty place with lots of hypocrisy. There's lots of people going to these little shops and getting pornography under the counter. And they either look Britain respectful people. men. And it shows you the idea of Britain is... This respectable country is not true. It's never been true. The, the human nature yeah. will be below the surface. It also has the prostitutes and the uh, models for these, um, these these magazines just been very normal and working class. And it's an exploitation of the working class, the good looking girls to work class. It's the exploitation of them because they can get paid to do this stuff. And it's just yeah. for, the, uh, for the jollies of all these old men, really. It's just the idea of um, it's an exploitative uh, field and it's just the way the country works. It's very sexist. Like Women are only viewed as objects in a lot of these places. They're not really viewed yeah. as anything else. I think it's interesting because obviously it came out about a month before Psycho and I don't yeah. know how Brit British critics reacted to Psycho, but I think part of the problem, like I said, is it's because the view of Britain they perhaps didn't like, compared to if it was Psycho, it was America, that doesn't really affect us, whereas the fact that it was Britain and it's the portrayal of Britain, I think that might have been another, you know, one of the problems. I think Psycho did a rough ride critically as well, but I quickly, yeah. because it made a lot of money, they switched gear pretty quickly and they realised they got it wrong. But this one, because it was sold as an exploitation movie, didn't really have a chance to linger and that actually make an impact. So it became like a yeah. cult movie. The, uh, the the film was better than Psycho, it released the same time as Psycho, but no one knows about it, type of thing. Yeah. Plus, it's more also, than Psycho. I think part of it was Michael Powell's reputation, you know, as doing you know, the red shoes and all these things, and then he does this viewed as kind of sleazy exploitation film, even though it's far more intelligent than that. Plus, you can tell it's Michael Powell directing it. I yeah. mean, um, the... First of all, you move a shearer in a part in the middle yeah. of it. It was lead from the red shoes in it as a used stand-in, basically. Yeah. Middle East stand-in. And, uh, and the parody in all these um, British films are awful and people have forced to sit through and they're just watching these films with these, like, these ladies who have no personality. And that's what he's working on. Yeah. And it just shows you that, like, how dead... British film actually is at the time. You know. Yeah, because he was very aware. He watched a lot of cinema. He wasn't one of those filmmakers who lived in a bubble. He did watch a lot of cinema and he knew what was going on. Um, and obviously distribution problems later in his career. That was because people weren't looking for that kind of film that he was trying to make. So there's, yeah. like you say, there's lots of points about British cinema at that time. Yeah, because I mean, he was always, I think, pretty much against British cinema. I think it was boring, and a lot of the films that were made were pretty lifeless, and there was nothing to save anything. They were just product for a certain yeah. class who didn't want much of the films. And you can tell in this film he hates them because the film they're making, it keeps on getting disrupted by all these problems, looks completely worthless. Yeah. 
It looks like yeah. the most boring film ever, and it's and that's completely intentional. Obviously, you have to remember when Powell and Pressburg were at their peak, they were doing stuff that nobody else in Britain was doing because everybody else in Britain was just doing these kitchen sink dramas, basically. Yeah. And while they were doing technicolor extravaganzas. So. Yeah. And this one's tried by a technicolor extravaganza, this film they're making, but it's terrible. It's so obvious yeah. the dialogue is absolutely awful. It's like even the people behind the scenes are bored by it. It's like, all right, let's do this. It's like obviously yeah. they know that they'll make a piece of trash, which makes it funnier because it's like, um, mm-hmm. everything interesting is going on behind the scenes rather than in front of the camera. Yeah. Which we're also filming. Yes. And again, but, making making the killer sympathetic as well was like a masterstroke because that just adds to the complexity of it rather than just making obviously the baddie, let's make him one dimensional. But again, Powell and Marx just make him sympathetic, which is yeah, problematic. Yeah, because he, he's one of the most human characters, him and the when played by Anna Massey, they're the interesting yeah. characters. And the rest of the world's kind of. Um, Alienating and coarse, and just people yeah, out for and, basic yeah. needs, and it's really it's a world basically where there's no soul involved in anything, any interaction. It's just for the most basic stuff. What can you do for me? Or I just want this basic and boring. And it's just a real Britain that is it's post colonialism, and it's just like, we'll just try and get by and do our best, but not really. We'll just try and half ass it, and it's that feeling in the world, and these pe- two people in the centre are much more interested. They have much more idealism for what they're doing, even though yeah. one of them is completely demented. Yeah. Yeah, but you want him to somehow get through it, even though you know he's doomed, but you still yeah. want him to actually get out of it, but he's never yeah, going to get out of it. No, I mean, the police are there just as the signs of doom. I mean, they don't yeah. get them for any other reasons, he makes mistakes because he's so, so obsessed. Yeah. I mean, they wouldn't have caught him otherwise because they're so stupid. Yeah. You know, it's him getting himself caught more than them catching him. Yeah, because at the end of the day, he wants to do the final thing to complete his masterpiece. <laughs> yeah. Which is to um, basically kill while filming. So you've got the phallic symbol going towards the woman. And it's like that idea of cinema can only do so much, but some people are obsessed with that image and they can't really get beyond it. Yeah. And the idea is it's taken, it's taken over from sexuality, it's taken over from life. Life has become something that's been mutated into this other form that's not very satisfying, but if you're stuck in this tunnel, you're really trapped. Yeah, because even though he's killing women, it's not for sexual reasons, unlike so many other films about killers who kill women. I mean, but it is, though, the same weird way, but it's, it's like British no, it's filmmaking. A surrogate, but... Yeah, it's like British filmmaking. It's so under the surface. It's it's stronger because it's there, but it's not been acknowledged, really. Yeah. Because he's so like immature, he can't really process it, yeah. ultimately. He's, he's not... And in the headspace to process that kind of stuff. Yeah. Does that make sense, mm-hmm. what I said? Yeah, but when you actually realise what's going on when he's filming them, it's such a wonderful reveal. Yeah. What attachments he has. Yes. <laughs> he's got all of his little cameras and there's always little things in his room and and again, it makes me feel guilty because I've got these little cameras as well and it's like, oh God... And there's a really good line, all this film is not healthy. Yes. Stop being so silly. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it really is like a, it's, it's almost like a child and his way he hasn't really developed yeah. in any real way. He's, he's very kind of scared of the world and very much trapped within this system of his own mind. But again, it's another it's a word about cinephilia as well, the fact that you're living life through other events and other people living life. You're not living life you know, yourself. You have yeah. to do it through others. Yeah, um, yeah. he's trying wonderful. to invent stuff through filming it rather than experiencing it as well. He's not trying to even yeah. experience it properly. He's got a yeah. distance from it. And again, it is like Manhunt in the sense that everything is seeing and watching rather than experiencing. Yeah. because Recording and 
watching it again and again. Yeah, it was like a fear of experiencing in this character. He's terrified of experiencing things, which is an interesting element to the film. Yeah, because but his father um, yeah. constantly had him being shit scared, apparently. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, as the ultimate director and his subject, and artist and his subject, kind of thing. Yeah. Really. Which will get us to the second film later. <laughs> yes. But yeah, no, the. It really is a wonderful film, and it's funny as well. I mean, you forget yeah. how funny it is, and. Um, I mean, the use I mean, of music's really good. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, this is the one where you didn't miss Pressburger as much because Power was on his own thing, really. Yeah, and the script by Marx is really good and really intelligent. So yeah, that's kind of an eco to Pressburger anyway. So I think it's an eco and some of the Pressburger stuff for for for, yeah, but, for character and for yeah. dialogue was better, but this works fine for what it is. It's, as far as intelligence and actually yes. talking about things. Um, because again, there was always like a dark undertone to a lot of Powell and Pressburger films. It's not as if it's a yeah. sort of sudden shock or there's some dark stuff in a, in a Michael Powell film. I know. I mean, just look at people, not look at uh, Red Shoes. Yeah. I mean, Pretty that's... dark when you look at it. Yeah. This is almost like the end of the road for that kind of thing. It's almost like this was always, always there. It kind of reminds me, you know, how when they did Twin Peaks, they did the Twin Peaks movie. Yeah. And people were shot by Twin Peaks movie because it was like, yeah. why, why is it suddenly so dark? It was like, that was always there. Yeah. They've just taken away all the shine. That's just the stuff that was there anyway, below the surface. Yeah, the people that only watched the TV show and weren't aware of any other David Lynch films. And then when Fire Walk With Me came out, it was like, like oh, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. It's the same thing with this. I think it was, a, it was, it was like basically a culture shock of... I mean, this yeah. was still always there, wasn't? I think everyone realised this was always there in the films. This is tied up to my life and death, and all yeah. the stuff. Yeah, it's like all this stuff is always there in the films. They just uh, didn't see it. Yeah, I think a lot of the critics just didn't get the Pill and Pressburger films and just looked at them on the surface as kind of bright, cheery films. And then when this came out, they were shocked. But if they actually read those films properly, then it wouldn't be that much of a surprise. No, I mean, it's, it's a fairly clearly intelligent filmmakers going through their films. Yeah, this one just, I think it was also, it was purely, it's also basically because it's about people watching films and how damaged it can be to you. And these are critics yeah. who make a living watching films. They do not like being told, yeah, you're just as nuts as the rest of us. You're as nuts yeah. as the filmmakers. You're just as perverted as well. Yeah, I think that really got them. And plus, it was looking to the actual culture as well in Britain, which had been this repressed culture, yeah. it got more and more repressed. It was about to break open with the 60s. And this was just made before that. This was, really, this was basically the rock that everyone was complaining about in the 60s. This was yeah. an example of it. It was just like, yeah, this is all the horrible stuff that's going on that no one talks about. And again, very much like Manhunter is one of those films that you think is more lurid than it actually is, because there's, like, no gore. I don't think there's any blood. There's no nudity or full nudity. Yeah, I mean, It's very much like Manhunter. You think Manhunter is a much more violent film than it actually is. And there's even a blind woman in it as well. Yeah. So I don't know whether um, yeah, critics it's... thought they were watching something that was actually more lurid than it actually was. Well, I think because the first scene what was the most lurid scene in the film. Yeah. Pretty much the first scene was shooting the kind of pornography and it was like, yeah, uh, it's quite shocking to them. And then I've imagined stuff like that, the rest of the film, it wasn't there. But what was there was something more disturbing about child abuse and how that leads to, that can lead to someone becoming far more disturbed if they've got the, they don't have any of the backup to kind of get them through the trauma they suffered. Because, I mean, the big thing yeah. is, they make a point is, his father was viewed as a great man in his field. So no yeah. one was ever going to say, oh God, his experiments have been, been rotten. Yeah. They were all going to be like, everything's fine, he was a great man in his field. So it was, not that this guy could get support. I mean, society had pretty much said, your dad was a genius, so stop whining. Yeah. 
So, uh, which is a big but part it's... of British culture, is they were not, they don't like look under the rocks. I mean, just look at yeah. Jimmy Jimmy Savile thing. You know, for years, no one ever touched it, and it was like yeah. everyone knew. Yeah. It's that British culture of do not look under to comfortable truths. You don't want to do that. Yeah. So, uh... but for me, it's in that influential group of what I believe eyes out of face, Psycho and Peeping Tom, all within like five years of each other. Yeah. Which were really influential moving forward. Well, I think Vertigo is more like Peeping Tom than Psycho, though, ultimately. Like, no, but just that group of films yeah, no. as far as their influence moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, there was just this feeling at the time of trying to do something. There was, there was some, it, was, it was that point where the new wave was starting up and film became much more self-reflective and yeah. Hitchcock was doing weird things even though a lot of it didn't feel like he was fully conscious of all the implications of what he was doing. He seemed to instinctively have those ideas but not quite get them intellectually. Um, and we're going to go forward really from that to people like De Palma and other directors who are much more interested in exploitation and the what it means to be a watcher type of thing. This was kind yeah. of the... And a lot of the based on Godard stuff as well, but watching and um, what cinema means. So it was all, it was, it, was kind of, it was kind of a gateway drug to what was going to come. Yeah. Just like most of Powell's work, it was ahead of his time. Yep. And it was, uh, it's wonderful, but as dark, though, yeah. you have the, a lot of the fact that you're going to be disturbed. We haven't even mentioned, we haven't even talked much about Anna Massey and her character, her blind mother, and that is yes. a very important part of the film because she's always the humanity, the, kind of young, the youth of the country who's just starting to get an idea of some of the darkness that's going on below the surface, really. Yeah, because she knows there's something off with Mark, but not quite. She's trying to help him. what it is, but she knows that he's at a crossroads. Yeah, like she knows. He's being damaged by somebody. She's trying to help him through it, and she doesn't realize he's 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 way too far gone. There's there's no, and she knows she knows when he's looking in the window. <laughs> yeah, she can tell that he's there. It's... Yeah, and so can his mother. Can his mother. Her mother just knows there's something off with him. There's yeah. she knows he's too far gone. Like just instinctively, she knows that there's something near that's rotten. And the fact that they're talking about the landlord and then he's the landlord. <laughs> it's just yeah. Like, that's another nice little detail. Yeah. It's almost like James Whale type touch for like the old dark house, that kind of feeling yeah. of the of God up the top of the stairs type of thing. It's that same kind of humour, like um this so mysterious like landlord. Too high, I'll drop it. Yeah. The mysterious landlords are a total sicko. <laughs> yeah. And he's all those he's listening to everybody as well. And the he can't interact with him. He has to listen to them and not f- and feel uncomfortable around them. Yeah. And the hardest drink he's got is milk. Yep. It, it's almost like someone childhood. who's watching all these channels today now and not can't actually communicate with people. Yeah. yeah, like us, basically. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I promise we do not kill people. Yet. No, no not when people are looking. All right. Speak for yourself. People are bad, cinema good. That's the message. Yeah. yeah. yeah we have not learned anything from this film. We have learned nothing at all. No. But it is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And, it, and if you do watch a projector, you will feel guilty. You will feel like, yeah, I'm probably a sicko. Yeah, I need to yeah. get out more. <laughs> yeah. Not really. No. There's Would nothing you, out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Pill really was right about what people could be like sometimes as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes it obvious why he's this way, like how he can't trust people. It's like, yeah, because everybody's seen this film, Papa Anna Massey, as trouble, even the policemen are scummy yeah. and horrible, or it's an attack on people that don't have any talent. Like the cast in the film and the people who are making the film. Yeah. Well, the only person who has any talent is more of a shiver for dancing. And it's yeah. really fun that Pearl has a dancing scene in the middle of a serial killer movie. You don't get that very often in films. No. 
that must have pleased the critics, really. Yeah, no, but it's quite fun to see him take one of his major stars and actually have her in as a bit part and then kill her. So, so the, yeah. those two must have been on. They must have a sense of humour about that stuff because there's no way you'd ask someone who wouldn't get the joke. They can come and play a has been, I'll kill you. Yeah. So they must have got on, <laughs> really. Yeah. It's, it's not something you ask of someone you don't go on with. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, people yeah I mean, if you haven't it. seen it, it's a must see. Yeah. Way better than Psycho. Yeah, it's not even yeah. close. Yeah. And uh, as Jingle must see. So, uh, so shall we go on to the other one then? We're just going yes. to start insulting Britain for the rest of the, for the rest of the video otherwise. Yes, let's um, talk about Age of Consent, shall we? Yep. <laughs> um, also, this is 1969. This is Michael Powell's last theatrical release. Um, obviously, he'd made films without Pressburger to varying degrees of success. I don't think any of them were really that successful. Um, but this one was starring and produced by James Mason. It's about an artist who is fed up of being just a commodity and his work just being a commodity. He needs to get revitalised, so he decides to go to Australia around about the Great Barrier Reef and kind of reconnect to colour, reconnect to nature and reconnect to art. And while he's there, he finds somewhat of a muse in a very young Helen Mirren, who's the first job, yeah. um, or first film. Um, and there's a few other characters that he crosses paths with. He wants, he wants to go there for peace and quiet, but it doesn't quite work out that way. But he does find a muse in Helen Mirren um, and a wonderful dog called Godfrey. Yes. It's a hard film to talk about because it's one of those films that's more about the atmosphere and the vibe and the characters rather than any narrative drive. Yeah. yeah. So if you're it, looking for a narrative drive in this film, this isn't really that kind of film. Yeah, it actually is one of those things is the bits that are most annoying about this film are the narrative drive attempts. Yeah. Because uh, I watched the director's cut, and I'd watched the longer director's cut, and the stuff that was annoying was uh, the Jack McGowan stuff. Yeah, and he's a good McGurin actor. Character, he's yeah, a good actor, but, but he's stuck in a part that's annoying. Yeah, intensely annoying, but it's like you don't need this character in this film. Yeah, and Helen Mirren's grandmother um, could maybe go down a notch or two. Yeah, she's really overacted. I mean, the big thing with this is the some of the supporting acting is a bit too cartoonish. They needed to yeah. be... And even Michael Pell suggested that himself afterwards, said it was too cartoony and too comic, and it was it kind of ruined the mood. Yeah. And, and you see that there's... And this, this is the film with the two that you needed Chris Burke to come in and do a rewrite on. Yeah. Because uh, there's stuff in this film that Paul Chris Burke could do easily when they were together that because yeah. they did comedy characters as well, and they always worked out a lot better than this. It just feels like the writing wasn't great, and the actors going to do so much for the writing. Yeah, because Pressburger did some work on their weird mob. He just didn't take any credit for it. Um, but you're right; it could have did with a Pressburger polish. Yeah, yeah, because the stuff with James Mason and Helen Mirren are all great because they're they're just yeah. Anything we do with those two are great, but anything to do with some of these other supporting characters, it's just like you can feel the director's lost interest in the film. He just doesn't want to be there. He'd rather be back there with the yeah. other stuff. If it was Mason Mirren and the dog for an hour and a half, it would have been yeah. much better. But there's like 20 minutes of padding that you don't need like, at all. Yeah. And um, cause, yeah, because I mean, it's like Jack McGowan character comes in early when Mason's trying to escape from the world, and it's almost like he's a character to show what, how horrible the world can be. Yeah. And then he comes in later on to destroy Paradise, which, as a narrative, it works. They've got a good actor playing him, but the writing's too comic, and it's yeah. you, you need some menace as well, someone who's actually might be more awful or something. You needed something else there that would have added some tension. Instead, he's just annoying. Yeah. 
because then Mason gets upset because you know he steals stuff and he's away, and then he actually realizes oh he's away. That's actually a good thing. Um, and they, they get back to um, what they were doing as far as yeah, Helen like the, yeah. posing for his paintings, but it's yeah. like that could have been done a lot better and a lot differently. Yeah, it's almost like the films fed up with him as well. The films yeah. could have wasted ten minutes of bloody guy and all these scenes we don't like. I mean, that's that's yeah. a big problem. The film is those kind of characters, and even the um, the grandmother of Helen Mirren, she's too broad. She's just too yeah. broad. She should be much more of a menace and stubborn figure. It was because yeah. she was the stuff she was doing was horrible, yeah. and it was like there was there wasn't enough levity there to show how damaged this woman was. It just felt like this is like a, a sitcom character, and it's not quite satisfying. Yeah, because even if we kind of found out why she was in the state she's in, I'll just she tell the like actress one dimension. do less. Yeah, really, it was like needed... dialed it down a couple of notches. But I think it needed a different actress and needed a different writer for this one because the writing this one is... It's it feeling the best stuff was... Standards. Well, I, think I always felt that the best stuff was stuff to be up on set when you saw the set and the actors were acting together with, with James Mason and Helen yeah. Mirren. It felt like it was as they were working out they did all the good stuff and then when they had to go back to the script, that's when it was like, all oh, this stuff again. Yeah, because the best things in the film are the visuals and when there's less dialogue it actually works the best it's one of those films that you could almost make silent yeah because again the use of colour is wonderful obviously the natural setting is beautiful Um, and again it's about getting back to nature and getting back to art because nature is always an important thing throughout Powell's work and his life. Yeah, and it, it's all, I mean, basically, um, he feel that's what they were interested in. And it's like um, all the scenes with Mason just dealing with the dog as well and dealing with Helen Mirren and trying to work out what his relationship actually has with her. A lot of it's the looks rather than what's said. Yeah. Really. And it's, a, it's about like the artist and the, and the muse and where's the exploitation and where's the genuineness and all that stuff's interesting like how genuine yeah. are you to your muse and how exploitive are you and that's enough yeah, to, they, to fuel a film yeah and they both have different ideas of what's actually going on which is quite nice yeah so all this stuff's great and it's like if you just cut out all that stuff and we're fine because yeah. there's like a, there is like a good hour 20 in this film that's wonderful it's just yeah. the which makes him more annoyed with the bad stuff because it's like you don't need this yeah, I mean, also there was kind of constant, not really friction, but back and forth between Mason, the actor and the producer and things that he wanted in the film or things that he was suggesting in the film and some of those things Powell put in because he liked them and also other things he didn't. Um, and you do kind of feel that there is some of that in it. It's not kind of what one person's vision, it's more a kind of hodgepodge. Yeah. A combination, yeah, yeah. But, but I also think that everything there could have been done right with a better script. Like, you feel this yeah. if they'd figured this out before they left and got another writer to just to finesse it, you yeah. could have, it could have been fine, you know. Because, I mean, I, th- I think, um, everything in there is stuff we when we get a normal film as if it's like we need to entertain people, it's just the way it's done. Yeah. You just feel like the stuff they were interested in, and the stuff they were really interested in was the good stuff, and our stuff just wasn't there. Because there was a mismatch of quality that yeah. comes across. It's like so many scenes are really great, and there's other scenes that just aren't. And it's like, well, what happened? Yeah, because I mean, listening to the commentary, you know, the first day of the shoot, the generator fell into the sea, so they had <laughs> to like make do with like, and then. Constantly, there was storms going on, so they, they did have to kind of work around things. And I don't know whether some of that hurt in the writing, and some of it was kind of, you know, it wasn't a perfect shoot. Yeah, I know, but I, mean, I think if you uh, your bad shoot, you still don't know where you're going and what you're directing, then yeah. you'll be fine. I feel this time did feel that they were going different directions, or there was something they needed for us yeah. producers that 
was kind of in the way of this the good stuff. So it just doesn't feel like cohesive, really, as a film. It's just like there's so many great highs and lows. <laughs> it's like, yeah. There's a mixed bag, but yeah. Uh, but but all the stuff with Mason and Helen Mirren as he's um as he's drawing her and all the rest of it, and there's so much nudity in this film. Yeah. I mean, and the actress Helen she, Mirren says she actually thinks she was the first actress to in a mainstream film to have that much nudity. Yeah, obviously Columbia had a problem. <laughs> yeah. Had a problem with a lot. And even at the start, the painting of Helen Mirren to look like the Columbia. Yeah. Lady, even though she was naked, they had a problem with that. They had a problem with the score. They had a problem, obviously, with as Helen Mirren is actually realizing her body and the power her body actually has. And yeah, those all the good stuff. They had problems. Yeah, all the good stuff. Well, that was they had a problem with the good stuff, and they, were, they didn't mind the bad stuff. No, oh, all the Jack McGowan clowning about, they were probably quite happy with. Yeah. I mean, he was obviously there for another, another name, but obviously he was, it was just like, again, he must have known he was dealing with weak material because he's trying his best, but he doesn't have that much interesting things to say. Yeah. You know, and it's... Uh, he's one note, and the grandmother's one note, and even yeah. the postman is kind of one note. But the postman's not in enough to really be great, and he's just like a postman. He doesn't feel as bad as the other ones. But they... The woman who lives nearby with the chickens is very one note, and it's like, yeah. God. That's, that's why a character Press Booker would have killed, basically. He'd have yeah. found ways to make it really good. And this one is just like, nah. Because it's an interesting yeah, setup, could, but nothing yeah. happens. You could argue there's just too many people in it, even though there's only like five people in it. Yeah, because you only really interested in two of them and the dog. Yeah, the dog's wonderful. The scene yeah. where. He's uh, tied up, but he's not really in escapes, and then he yeah, goes back and puts his leash on. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. That's wonderful. Yeah, and you're feeling Mason doesn't care anyway, if he was or wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, and Mason's great in this film as well. James Mason's really good in this film. He really yeah. plays up. He's always an underrated actor, and he could always do underplaying really well. But he gets to be more earthy, more like a person. It's funny seeing him in shorts, because he normally wears suits in films. Yeah. Because the commentary is really interesting. I think it's Kent Jones that does it, but he talks about, obviously, at that period of time, the studio system and the studios looking after stars is kind of over, so stars had to kind of make their own way and look after themselves, and James Mason did a really good job of doing that. You know, becoming a producer, and then he got his niche as kind of a character actor. Um, But obviously, as producer, like I said before, there was kind of... I want to do this, and Powell was like, "No, I want to do that." So, yeah, it, it must have been fine though, because they want to, they try to make Tempest after this, even though it didn't go. Yeah, they try to make it. It's obviously whatever the yeah, problems were, yeah. it wasn't like enough to really cause any lasting damage. Yeah, but, but yeah, no, it wasn't the success they thought it was going to be. Yeah, but I think because uh, we've been we're around the title, eighty percent, because Hillman's character is seventeen in this film. She was 22 when she made it, but she was playing a 17 year old. Yeah. And it is playing around the idea of um, an older man and a younger woman, and they're making it romantic, but they're. But actually, they, they, they do point out how exploitative it actually can be, how deranged it can be in the, the most cynical elements of it. So it's not like they, they yeah. avoid it, really. But it also is kind of crazy at the same time. But they'll try to do yeah. it sensitively. Especially the end title song. Yeah. Now that she's needing age of consent. Yeah. So. yeah. It's quite bad. Yeah, I mean, I mean, some things don't age as well as they should. <laughs> yes. I think I try to aim it for an Australian audience with a bit more body at times. I think it was aimed for the Australian marketplace where it did really well. So I think it was one of those ones where the I think that's where a lot of the humour is in there that we don't like very much is for that yeah. audience. And it's, that's a bit broader. Yeah. It's too broad for our sensitive, you know, our sensitivities. Yes. We demand art. Yes. But I would say um, the special features in the Indicator release are fairly substantial, so I would certainly recommend picking it up. 
Yes. Well it's the limited editions out of print, but this should be a standard edition. Yeah, but there's so much on the desk. I mean, yeah, uh, you get, all you're really missing is a booklet if you don't get the yeah. original version, because but there's so, the desk is packed full of stuff. Yeah, there's stuff by Ian Christie. Um, there's an interview with Michael Poole and Emery Pressburger from 1985. It's 105 minutes. There's an 85-minute interview, a lecture with Michael Powell. You know, it's absolutely stacked. There's a 13-minute conversation with Helen Mirren. Martin Scorsese even talks about it for six minutes. Yes. So it must be good. Yeah. No, it's, it's, got, it's, a, it's got The Boy Turned Yellow, which is a yeah. lovely little film. Which is the uh, Pearl Pressburger collaboration for the Children's Fund, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, so you get a lot on it. It's and this film stacked. is a good film. I just think it is, is one of those ones you really need Pressburger, though. It's where you yeah. really feel the lack of press Parker in this one. Yeah. You don't really so feel a, it in people talk, you do feel it here. Yeah, it's a good double bill of one that, like you say, you don't necessarily need press Parker, another one you desperately needed press Parker. Yeah. Because, I mean, because they have two films about watching and uh, men and women and all the rest, but we've done a very unconventional week, it's all about art involved in it as well. Yeah. But one has a lot of intelligence in the writing. Another one is intelligence in the directing and in the acting, but maybe less so in the writing. Maybe that you get the feeling yeah. as they worked a lot out on the set and worked a lot of stuff out by how they did it. You know, yeah. So a lot of it really lot. is how they're doing it. Yeah, and again, a lot of Paul Pressburger films are about art and the sacrifices you make for art and the importance of art. And yeah. And they're both about that, both these ones, but yeah. Yeah, they, one's better than the other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Peeping Tom's a straight up masterpiece. And Age of Extent isn't, but it has, has some wonderful it's more elements. It's a mixed elements. bag, but there's still yeah. a lot to yeah. like about it. It is interesting to see Helen Mirren this young, because yeah. she really became of age when she hit her 30s, really. She became big then. Before that, she was just a working actress, really. Yeah, but as they say, if that was your first film and you're working with James Mason and Michael Powell, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the thing. A lot of her more famous films came when she hit kind of in her 30s or mid-30s and onwards. She's, she's yeah. a rare actress who really kind of came into her own at the, at the age when most actresses don't. Really. Well, when you think this was 69, and when was it Excalibur? 81, 82? 80, 80, I think. 80. So that's like 11 years. So. You think she did theatre mainly between then? Between them, yeah, because she started in theatre before she did Age of Consent. So. Yeah. Because she's credited in the credits as from the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah. So, yeah, so she was in theatre mainly until then. But, um, but yeah, it is interesting to see because she's, she's, when she came back when she was a lot more polished, so she's a lot more experienced. This is her raw, basically. But that's what you needed for the part. So. Yeah. And Mason is, as usual, excellent. Just really yeah. good actor. And Godfrey the dog is spectacular. Yeah. Yes. So do we have anything else we need to say about Age of Consent? Um, I don't think so. A kind of mixed bag of a film, but a wonderful release by Indicator. Yep. I'm glad I watched it, but I have got to say, I think it's my least favourite films we've talked about so far. Age of Consent. Yeah, I mean, it's not a great film by any stretch of the imagination, but it has its... Like yeah. you said, if it was 80 minutes long, it would be a much different film. Yeah. We need a viewer's cut, cut of the stuff we don't yes. like. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, thanks everyone for watching. We hope you enjoyed yes, this. Um, we'll we see you again on the next episode. Whatever yep. that is. Yep. See you later. I should point out that my my channel next month in December will be sporadic because it's December. So. And my channel will be as sporadic as it usually is. Yes. <laughs> well, I'll see you later. Bye. Bye.